My name is Robert Ficalia. I'm here to talk about policy governance with OSCAL. Uh, the first uh, pro tip I realized as I walked to the door, long titles don't fit well on these, <laughs> on these uh, boards, so I've shortened it. Uh, just a little bit about who I am. I'm the co-chair of the Kubernetes Policy Workgroup. Um, I've been working for the last several years with the CNCF tag and the Kubernetes SIG security. I do have a day job, and uh, in that job, I help companies uh, through their SOC 2, HIPAA audits, and things like FISMA, CGIS, FedRAMP. And in that journey, that's where I encountered uh, something we'll be talking about today, OSCAL. And then uh, in my copious free time, I do play a lot with uh, machine learning and especially with graph databases. And you'll see some of those touch points in the presentation. Um, just a, a quick pitch for the policy work group itself. Uh, we started 2019. We've been focused on uh, what we like to call big P policy and little p policy. So big P is kind of the human readable, human understandable policy concepts. And little p policy is uh, that configuration policy. More if you're in the DevOps and working in manifests and Kubernetes, these are the types of policies you're probably referring to. Uh, we have created a CRD, and uh, we're working on a cap for that uh, that is aligned with OSCAL. And I'll get into what OSCAL is for those of you who don't know. And that helps standardize the output. Uh, our CRD and cap is to help standardize the output of various configuration and policy checking uh, tools and pol policy enforcement engines so you can get a consistent uh, aggregation data structure. We've done several white papers working on a governance white paper, and some of the folks in the room I know are contributing to that. Uh, and there have been some open source uh, dashboards and adapters for the various uh, scanners and, and policy checkers. So more to come. Uh, we are working uh, as best we can with NIST and trying to do more with OSCAL uh, in Kubernetes and provide real world uh, examples. And uh, of course, many of you might be aware of the common expression language cap that was recently um, I think it's alpha, maybe it's beta. Anyway, it's a, a new uh, expression language for admission control in Kubernetes. So we're definitely trying to drill down on what we can uh, recommend around using that, best practices, patterns, et cetera. So uh, let's jump into this talk, though. So all of you are probably familiar, if you're at this talk, with basic policy questions. So uh, these are questions that you probably deal with, uh, especially managing a team or interacting with auditors or compliance uh, subject matter experts. These are the type of questions you might get at that big P policy level about your Kubernetes cluster or even your infrastructure as code um, or infrastructure broadly. Uh, I would like to highlight the last point because I hear this even most recently on a call today with a bunch of agency folks, a bunch of audit folks. You know, there's, there's this kind of lack of trust in, in what they see, what the data they're presented with is the documentation, and so you know, this is a, a foundational concern for how can you build a, a governance program around your policies and controls, which we'll get into, uh, and build that trust so that they can trust how you're uh, presenting the system to the auditor, how the auditor can trust that you're giving them the correct information and vice versa. Uh, at, the, at the lower level, the Kubernetes level, uh, those configuration policies are you know, where you see a lot of the tooling that you've probably seen at the conference. Uh, you're talking about you know, checking admission control, you're checking configurations against baselines like CIS benchmarks, you're checking you know, resource limits perhaps, you're even looking at cost controls, all expressed at the you know, Kubernetes manifest level in some way or form or you know, operators and uh, uh, other ways to, to automate that. Uh, you might be interested in you know, what your workloads are doing in aggregate and how you're isolating those, how you're defining network policies around those. You may be interested in verifying the identity and contents of those workload images. So these are the, the policy, little p policy uh, issues that we'll be wrestling with. And then again, I'll call it that last, as, as Kubernetes itself is deploying Kubernetes and deploying infrastructure as code and is becoming kind of a meta uh, provisioning or meta admin entity, there's the kind of bootstrapping process and then kind of the, the, the ability to meta-manage things um, as Kubernetes itself becomes the control plane for other control planes. Um, my basic view of how I look at the, the model here is we're going to stick to that declarative configuration uh, 
idea that Kubernetes brought to the forefront wasn't the first, but, but has certainly arguably been the most successful. Um, and I apply that in, in the realm of compliance by comparing what you might be able to do with GitOps and what, we, what I have seen done with GitOps versus what a traditional GRC that is, is the de facto reality today. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what that future state might look like. So an obligatory slide on what OSCAL is. If, you, if you're here, you might know it a, a little bit, but OSCAL is an initiative uh, uh, from NIST. Uh, they've been developing a standardized schema for expressing controls. So uh, these are uh, configuration checks or um, requirements at the framework level for what you must do as a system owner or uh, a system implementer to make sure that you conform with something like NIST 853. Uh, it's not necessarily specific to NIST 853 or any particular compliance framework, but they, they are NIST, so they started with that. Um, and it has a broad acceptance in the U.S. federal government and even uh, elsewhere in, uh, in healthcare. High Trust is also based on NIST 853. So it's a good place for them to have started, and they essentially layer on different schema models, uh, a catalog of all of the controls that you might need to apply to your system, a profile, we'll talk about what that is. Uh, component model is kind of the, the functional things in your system, the, the elements, the, the subsystems. You have to coalesce all of this into a system security plan. Now, in, in the today, uh, before things are, are all GitOps and automated, a system security plan might be a thousand page Word document that expresses all of the diagrams and all of the controls that you have collected from your catalog and your profile and you know, verbose human descriptions of how all of those controls are implemented, referencing other documents, referencing technical specs, referencing things um, that only the subject matter expert might be able to express. Um, so one of the goals is to put that in machine-readable format and then allow organizations to exchange that internally with auditors, reuse that system security plan to get authorizations uh, to deploy a system. Uh, and then quickly, just auditors have to be able to assess this. So you need an assessment plan, and then after you've scanned things, you're producing a, a, an assessment result, essentially a report. And then you have to tra track your risks. So they have a plan of action milestone. So those of you familiar with the government-led CONMON activities and know and love POAMs and uh, managing those risk logs. Uh, it just uh, the, Every OSCO file has a hierarchical a set of elements with lots of linking across different elements, and they have a, a universal, unique ID that is essentially the, the identifier that you can link across components to. Uh, and you can add various supplemental errata in the back matter. Um, so when you kind of merge Kubernetes policy, um, both kind of the big P and little p policy, with OSCAL, you, you get essentially compliance as code. If you can express your system in a machine-readable OSCAL form, and you can merge that, and we'll talk about various ways, merge that in with your policy as code, and all that is very traceable, now you get uh, compliance as code. And you have a governance structure that is standardized and reusable and shareable and auditable. Um, and just to call out you know, the policy report CR that I mentioned earlier, we align that with OSCAL, and Red Hat and IBM contributed some code to you know, extract from that an OSCAL uh, assessment report. Um, those of you might be familiar with Platform One out of the DOD. Uh, they extensively use OSCAL and Kubernetes, and they've got a lot of GitLab uh, examples of OSCAL for various uh, CNCF or Kubernetes-related projects. Uh, call out some of the folks from Defense Unicorns who are working on open source as well, uh, both with the tool they're, they're building and the Caverno open source engine. Uh, and then the, myself and a number of the CNCF projects are open sourcing more OSCAL and more tooling around OSCAL. Um, and we call that sledgehammer, state, local education, government, enterprise, and healthcare. So not necessarily specific to government, but highly aligned and like NIST, we'll be focusing on NIST 853. Um, and I've got a link at, at the end of the slide to that for those who are interested. Um, if you don't know why you would need to manage your policies, um, then you, you may not have tried to run a Kubernetes cluster uh, under a compliance regime like you know, FedRAMP or, or FISMA. 
Um, over time, these policies change, the requirements change, uh, incidents happen, vulnerabilities happen, and so you, you have to be proactive in how you govern and create and curate these policies. Reacting to that, it just amplifies the problem. And so, you know, especially if you're talking about making changes to kind of a steady stream of vulnerabilities, you're never gonna catch up. Um, I think, again, situations almost on a daily basis where folks are trying to exchange information securely, and is that, again, sending an Excel file, or sending a Word document, um, sending YAML or JSON, I mean, this across boundaries, across agencies, across organizations, or may or may not have different levels of clearance, um, you know, this is a real problem. So, you know, having a, a standard format that you can exchange over APIs is very important. Um, I, I, I guess last point there, I don't have to convince anybody that, you know, it, it's much more uh, cost effective to identify where your policies are going to need to change and control that change early in the process than later. Um, when you're trying to uh, operate under you know, time pressures and cost pressures and everything has to be reported out on those monthly Kanban calls. Um, yeah, and policy at large, it gives you, you know, consistency. Uh, the policy's code gives you guardrails. I think most of you have seen this. And there are various um, reasons that you want to centralize, control is the wrong word, but centralize governance of, of those policies so that you have consistency across your workload uh, identities, your access, and then again, this notion of having a continuous assessment of, of those controls and those implementations. And, and a number of other things here, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, skip forward. And then I think one, one real world problem that, that I see often is that, you know, as your Kubernetes clusters grow, uh, certainly the apps in those clusters grow, uh, you know, the challenges become exponential. And policy governance, policy it itself reduces that and kind of bends the curve. But policy governance, taking that to the next level, really kind of helps you, you know, wind up that complexity and control it in, in a more uh, linear fashion. And, you know, if you're, I, I kind of think of that, maybe not exponential growth, as I've looked at real world um, complexity grow over a number of clusters. It's more like a Fibonacci growth curve. Um, but you kind of twist that by uh, meta-managing your policy, you can hopefully get into a, a positive spiral. <laughs> um, this was just a quick kind of uh, textual heat map that I put up. Um, I just the idea being that governance of, of policy, policy itself has different utility at different time. And, and I would point out that, you know, there is some very obvious negatives as you're going through the early phases, right? You're going to take a hit on the ability to deploy things quickly by having to reason through all the controls that apply, by having to map this to different uh, frameworks, by having to um, uh, build that security in at the beginning, obviously it will have benefits on the tail end, especially as you start talking about SecOps and incident response. But it's not always a silver bullet and it's not always fun. <laughs> um, I'm gonna let everyone take a deep breath and um, kind of channel their uh, inner Bob uh, before I show you what I'm calling the, the compliance canvas. And we'll dab and take from the, the palette and, as we kind of work through this mess. <laughs> but at, at a high, high level, um, you kind of want to understand your system from the user view. So, you know, on that left, you've got the mission. You know, how are we going to accelerate this? You know, then we have to worry about our threats. And I'm going to talk through each of the different policy ops that, that we observe as being essential. And, um, make sure that we cover at least some high level. It's, it's going to be impossible to go through all the deep dives and talk through various concrete examples and everything, but I'll try to call it a couple. Um, and then on the bottom, you know, the substrate is, you know, as OSCAL tooling becomes better, so whether it's through the policy work group or some of the other open source projects I mentioned or commercial tools, um, the tooling is going to enable the generation and consumption of these various models, the catalogs, the you know, component definitions. We'll talk about different variations of that. And then ultimately, kind of that system security plan, really system model, becomes, I think, the central governing resource that, that unifies everything together. And in terms of security operations, those, you know, the assessment plan, assessment results, that's, that's where you're gonna kind of live on a daily basis. Uh, so we'll try to connect all these together as we move through the rest of the presentation. Um, I would, you know, remind everyone, no one, probably everyone here has this experience that this is a journey. You're not going to go from zero to everything in one step. Um, folks who 
you try to do that, often find out that it, it kind of implodes and you have to uh, argue for trying again. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about these essential ingredients that I've called out. So first and foremost, you, you have to collect and curate a policy library, right? And, and this very much maps to uh, your control catalog. That's that OSCAL artifact for enumerating all the different controls and different families or groups. And we'll talk a little bit more about the profile, but essentially it's a, uh, a tailoring of the different controls that you might have under different frameworks or for different systems or for different use cases, and you can parameterize that. Uh, the current benchmarks like CIS, even some of the more um, cloud-specific benchmarks are useful fodder for starting this curation process. They've typically mapped all of their cloud-specific or Kubernetes-specific controls to NIST 853, um, you know, EKS, AKS, Google, Config, they've all done some mapping to NIST 853, but more broadly, they've mapped it to other control catalogs, be it PCI or, or others. Um, so that's a great way to kind of bootstrap your, your catalog review process and um, start using the tooling to generate uh, OSCAL catalogs. Um, and then in those control sets, you're going to obviously look at preventive controls, detective controls. I'll, I'll have a little bit more about the kind of threat modeling around that. Um, and ideally, again, getting back to that idea of GitOps versus GRC, all of this is being managed from day one in a Git repo, you're managing PRs to change the OSCAL catalogs to manage your profiles. And you know, there may be some challenges with mono repos for those of you who, who love those. <laughs> um, I, I don't recommend that folks de novo create policy from scratch, copy and paste uh, when you can. Um, there are various strategies for this. This should be maybe uh, commonplace for Kubernetes resources or manifest themselves. Um, so the different mechanisms, the, the, the policy engine support, uh, the policy languages, and then there are different uh, API and tooling frameworks they can use with those. Um, I'll also show an example of how you can kind of use uh, generative or transformation code to kind of create OSCAL on the fly from one of those policy engines. Um, and of course, there are many other DSLs, or you can use Python or other things to generate your, your OSCAL. Um, and then consume the OSCAL and generate the actual little p policies. And we'll talk about parameterization next. So those profiles, remember, are uh, selections of specific controls, and then you're parameterizing those so that the variables are not defined statically. That those can be defined uh, at deploy time or at even at post-deploy. Um, and so in support of that, you know, the, all of the major policy enforcement engines and languages support some form of, some form of templating with parameters. So Gatekeeper has a constraint template, um, allows you then uh, define constraints that invoke specific parameter, oops, parameter values. Uh, Caverno has rules uh, that support kind of open API v3, and OCM, which is an open source cluster management uh, project, has policy templates as well. Uh, now that you've got kind of all these templates and parameters, you've got to kind of bind it together. That's what I call policy assembly. Um, so you can map controls, and the example I'll show you is kind of mapping it to threat indicators. So you can annotate your controls with threats. You can then uh, annotate your policies by mitigating different threats, right? And then that way you can kind of use that to, to bind the two together. Um, you could do things, and in, in, in pro, uh, projects like GovCar and others have kind of used keyword regex or, or search and replace or even NLP uh, to, to match up kind of descriptions of your controls, description of your system, and kind of do that mapping. And they might add uh, you know, real world uh, threat indicators from real systems and kind of build a scoring rubric, uh, build a heat map of which, which attack uh, patterns match which components and which mitigations. So that's another option for kind of building an automation framework to generate your policy to control mapping. Um, let me just see if this will cooperate just to show you kind of what that could look like. So here, those of you who are familiar with Rego, um, it's from the open policy. Uh, so it essentially just, trans you can think of Rego and OPA as transforming you know, one JSON to another JSON, right? So here, for example, you might have your control catalog, um, and this is very kind of uh, demo OSCAL, pseudo OSCAL, I'll call it. But this is a kind of a typical JSON look for what, uh, a control might look like. 
Uh, and then what we've done is we've broken it out into uh, different components. And some of those components are functional components, but some of those components we actually define as security capabilities. So um, there's a good publication, if you've never read it, NIST IR 8011, goes into great detail around this. But you're defining you know, the, the, the capabilities, uh, the security features that you would need to implement this. So encryption could be one, RBAC could be one, right? Uh, checking integrity uh, could be one, signature verification. Um, in this case, you know, you have something like preventing unauthorized containers. Um, you would, you know, connect that to different threat IDs, so TTP name, hopefully you can see that. Um, uh, mitigation or defensive uh, techniques, like execution prevention. Um, and then yeah, you'd map that up with your controls. So let me say, go to the next set. Here's where I was talking about kind of mapping with heuristics or you can use you know, different types of modeling for threats. But you're going to want to define in, in Rigo your different uh, threat scoring, you know, that heat map. And then you can actually express how you're doing that threat mapping in code. Right? So here you're looking, now this is fairly demo hard coded, but you can easily call this from external data or put, call an API. But you're looking for a specific set of TTPs and you're you know, matching that up to the security capabilities and controls. Um, and then you can classify that further into, you know, is this a, protect, a protective control? Is this a detective control? Uh, or is this a responsive control? Right? And then you can map that to your, your particular framework. And then um, after you have that, where is the, sorry. Yeah, you can add some validation rules. Oscal, this was fairly new, I think in the last four or six months, the validation rules has become um, uh, a new part of the schema. Um, and then I think if I run this, let's see. Yeah, so here now on the output side, it's, uh, it's spitting out what would be uh, components that you would insert into your OSCAL, you know, typically as a component model, um, and then ultimately will generate a full SSP in the next uh, step. But here you're, you know, you're uh, describing how you enumerated the protect, the respond, the different rules that were triggered, and then you know what the threat coverage might be, um, and you know you're feeding that into the SSP. Here, um, you mapping those control implementations based on those scores that were generated in the previous step, um, and then you're making sure it has the right amount of coverage. And then this should this should produce. Yeah, the, the, now we've combined the security capabilities that address those different threats with different levels of scoring with the control, the functional control uh, components who needed those controls. And now we've, we've created our control implementation in OSCAL on this bottom output, right? And so it kind of maps it all the way back up to the control ID. What were my big P policy requirements? What rules did I use to actually determine that this threat and this capability match that control? And then you know I get an actual uh, OSCAL readable definition of that control implementation. And then at the very end, you put all that together. Um, you can actually use that to generate your assessment plan. And so this again, as another OSCAL artifact, gets gets you to the audit phase where now you're defining how am I mitigating those threats? How are those controls providing that implementation? And how as a tester can I you know write validation rules to support that? So, and I just, as an aside, that is the one cool thing about Rigo that I like is it's, uh, it, it can generate JSON from JSON, it can generate Rigo from Rigo. So, um, just something you guys uh, might be interested in and other use cases. Um, so let me go back uh, to the, the palette here. Uh, we talked about those profiles and, and base and parameters. I think the, the thing to call out, all of the languages and engines support some sort of variableization, parameterization. Uh, but again, managing the variables gets very complex very quickly as well. So while it, while it helps bend that Fibonacci curve, uh, it can quickly get too out of control. Um, I wish there was a silver bullet answer for that. I think it's something we still wrestle with because I've seen templates that are just nothing but variables. And it's like, how, how readable is that? How maintainable is that? Um, you obviously want to do policy validation like any other coding exercise. Um, you want to do local tests. You know, Caverno, OPA, Gatekeeper do some dry run. I'm sure uh, Kuborden and others do as well. Uh, Conf test, all these 
have some sort of local test capability. Uh, unit tests, usually in a pipeline. Uh, that way you're consistently, before you're updating your policy, distributing your policy, and you know that it's being tested. You, all of them support some sort of mocking um, and replay testing. And uh, I'm not sure all of them have a kind of a convenient coverage output, but I think at least Gatekeeper or OPA has a convenient coverage metric report. Um, and then so now that you've curated and mapped your policy library to specific controls, you've got to distribute this out. And again, uh, OPA, Gatekeeper, Caverno, um, others do support either an OCI bundle or you know, kind of not proprietary, but they're project specific bundling. You could obviously manage all these things in Git. Um, I think again, it goes back to that branching strategy and you know, how, how you're gonna connect that up to your policy enforcement point. Um, I, I'd say you know, OCI bundles are probably the thing I'd recommend. Uh, rack, uh, sorry, OCM has uh, their version of this, which is placement, and then they have a policy generator component. Um, and then there are cloud-specific ways you can do this. Again, Google Config, you can use S3 as that uh, bucket for, from pulling everything from Git into the bucket, and then OPA and, and Caverno can pull it from there. And there's an Azure policy extension uh, as well. Uh, I would note that as you distribute out policy, be sure to sign, digitally sign, cryptographically sign, and then make sure verification happens that the engines support Caverno, OPA, I should say OPA at least, Gatekeeper support it. Um, all of the engines support some form of enrichment where you can, instead of statically, as I showed in my demo, statically saying, you know, I'm looking for this TTP ID, I'm looking for this resource attribute, I'm looking for this namespace label, right? You can, you can pull external data and, and enrich the decision-making process. There are various ways to do this, um, kind of similar to the policy bundling itself. You can, you can layer it in, you can have separate bundles, you can put it in secrets. Um, but I think the, the interesting thing in kind of real world uh, situation is that you can, if you have a multi-tenant environment, uh, multi-cluster environment, you can now really tailor those policies to, to different uh, deploy time and even operational uh, time policy choices. So uh, this becomes a big thing if you know, those of you who have had to wrestle with say data isolation for GDPR and you know, across different uh, country boundaries, this is a very helpful uh, pattern to use. Um, the policy assessment reporting, I think there are lots of tools out there. Um, we obviously, as a policy work group, like the ones that support the policy report CR. Uh, we've tried to build some uh, adapters for those that don't have it. Uh, we're trying to get it into that cap, so hopefully it will become a standard uh, Kubernetes API and then everything will support it. Uh, there are Prometheus metrics, um, other ways to manage your assessment, execution, and aggregate data about what is uh, what violations you have. Um, we did, uh, there, as I mentioned, there's an open source policy dashboard, but there are a number of, of other open source and commercial dashboards that can roll up the policy violations. Um, and as OSCAL support becomes more prevalent in, in things like EMAS, other G GRCs, um, we expect to see m more of that display, that dashboard display of your uh, assessment results. Um, gosh, time-wise, I will, I will, this is really more what I call policy adjacent. This is not policy per se to remediate. Um, you, obviously, if you have everything controlled and, and, and on these guardrails and constraints, um, it makes remediation a lot more manageable and a lot more deterministic. Um, but I think you, know, you, can, you can use that policy report output um, or the, the gatekeeper audit output and you can then you know, generate PRs and then that would create new uh, sandbox uh, rules, network policies. Um, you can add different labels in response to different uh, attack indicators um, through admission control mutation. Um, yeah, and then you're obviously gonna have to track your, your poems and risks over time. Uh, you know, there are some cross-cutting concerns that, that will obviously be uh, touch multiple parts of that policy management process. So um, you know, those heuristics that I mentioned, you know, they really do cover that whole MITRE attack framework. So you're looking at this some, you know, slice through many different pillars. It's not always kind of neat and compartmentalized where you can build a policy snippet for you know, your, your volumes and a policy snippet for your image management. Uh, a lot of these are gonna have cross-cutting concerns. And, and this where having a, a good model to drive that, that policy generation helps. So you know, static analysis, 
very infrequently, but starting to see some interest in formal methods for that. Um, my personal area is uh, graphs and kind of using ML to do graph embeddings and graph mappings, and actually even uh, lower level model, uh, large language models uh, for machine learning have actually been recently shown to, to be able to model out different attack paths and defense sequences. So that's an interesting area of research. Um, so what's next? Uh, we need more real world examples. Um, so I mentioned uh, an open source project uh, that we have a number of CNCF projects contributing. Uh, Sledgehammer will be open sourcing OSCAL for component DAFs, this, you know, Rego policies that do the generation or the actual low level policies. And um, yeah, we need more tools. Thanks to, again, folks like Defense Unicorns um, and others who are building uh, open source OSCAL tooling. Um, and we really want to see some real world audits. And we're going to try to surface uh, as much as we can within the context of you know, sensitive host specific data. But we're going to try to uh, surface all of the assessment plan, assessment result artifacts in Sledgehammer. And, and more meta information about the processes that, that got us through that audit. And I think that audit community is right now l even less aware of OSCA. OSCA is new for everybody, but the audit community is not um, well tuned and ready to receive OSCA, um, and certainly not in a, a Kubernetes cluster environment, right, or a cloud native environment even. Um, so we're, we're hoping that this will be a resource for auditors. Um, and if there are any in the audience, please, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but getting them trained up and, and familiar with OSCAL, with Kubernetes and OSCAL, and then how to consume these artifacts. Uh, and with that, I will open it up to questions. Yes? Um, so earlier, there's another company called Tenable. They also released a similar product system called uh, Terascan, where they are also trying to I think, so I think there's going to be a lot of competing approaches. You know, everybody's looking at the same problem, kind of feeling it from different perspectives. And so there will be a lot of competing ideas. Um, OSCAL is, is very new. It's very open. Uh, developers are very flexible. I think it, in a very specific segment, i.e. government, it has a very strong endorsement in that NIST is the standards body that most agencies use. Um, and, in, and, you know, I don't think it's in any surprise to anyone that FedRAMP, uh, is a very popular framework for cloud-based services that government is are procuring, and FedRAMP has officially adopted OSCAL as its emerging and you know, very soon uh, required format. So I think the the vendors, the open source projects, uh, enterprises, homegrown, uh, you, if you're going to play in that area, you're going to have to uh, embrace OSCAL. But the good news is they're very flexible. So. Lessons learned from other projects and other approaches should be incorporated in that, and I think they would welcome that. Um, from the CNCF policy work group, I mean, we're, we're agnostic to you know, the tooling, the, the specific frameworks, but again, we just look at OSCAL as a very nice fit to the problems that, that come up in our work group. Yes? Could you elaborate on what Sledgehammer is? Yeah, Sledgehammer, um, I, I, See if I can go back and if it will pull up here and if it will show. Yeah, okay. So here it goes. Oh, we're going to rehome that. That's in my current GitHub. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, when we file the sandbox uh, ticket, we'll be putting it in our kind of a .org or .io. But um, oh gosh, is that going to be readable? Probably not. But yeah. So essentially. We want to deliver all of the OSCAL and, and any tooling that we create or any you know, configuration for other open source tools so that one could, in theory, um, generate all the OSCAL or use the templates that we create, um, apply it to a, a fairly vanilla Kubernetes cluster, and then use that either in an agency or as a host and go through an audit. And like I say, we we'll, we'll plan to put as much as we can from a real world third party, you know, they call three, we call them three pals, a third party uh, audit organization. Um, as much of those artifacts out onto the open repo de-identified from any actual 
IP addresses or sensitive you know, vulnerability scan output, et cetera. So that in theory, uh, especially agencies, we talk to a lot of agencies who are just getting caught up on kind of DevOps, right? And getting their heads wrapped around how to do Kubernetes at all. The lift to go from nothing today or very little today to a full, you know, reliable, production-ready Kubernetes operation is pretty huge, both in terms of staff and, and, and money, but really it's staff. So they're looking for a bit more of an easy button that they can say, give us some, some best practices that we can take and play with in our lab, or you know, the, you know, another ATO uh, uh, cloud provider can deploy. Um, you know, again, similar to, to Platform One. Uh, Platform One is you know, you know, pretty restricted in who can use it, and it has some significant costs, which again may price out some of the smaller um, you know, CIV agencies. So I, again, I wouldn't, and I would just, as a coder to that, I wouldn't see this as being competitive in any way. I, I think it's more a way for someone to dip their toes, to really understand what they're, what they're getting into, and then make a very informed decision, you know, maybe with a couple of pilot projects, get success, and then say, okay, we want to go to Platform One, we want to go to a commercial kind of software factory, DevSecOps platform, engineering uh, substrate. Now we know what we're getting into, and more important, you know, our AO, our, our, our authorization folks know what to expect and how to consume that OSCO. We know if our GRC can support it. So they do the discovery with Sledgehammer, get, get really comfortable with the, the operating model, and then can scale up onto something more, I guess, you know, enterprise scale or enterprise grade. Anything else? Um, I'd say be the I mean, as we're planning to generate the the OSCAL and the corresponding policies, and I think in kind of a similar way, uh, the the Caverno effort you guys have, um, and which you know we'd love to to collaborate on that because uh, again we're not picking OPA versus Caverno or any any particular tooling. Um, I'd say we'd want to take it one step further from just the policy generation and actually the OSCAL generation. So. Call so deploy the, maybe to answer your question, deploy the cluster, run the the OSCAL generation, which then will generate the little p policy, run your your conf test for lack of a better word, your assessment, and then generate your your SAR and then figure out what you have to fix. Um, could that be done in GitHub Actions or you know some some other CI CD or Argo? Sure, I don't see why not. So it, as long as because it's going to be generated code as much as possible through. The idea is that it, you wouldn't have to do point in time updates and kind of that branch and merge PR change. But um, TBD, <laughs> it's early days. Anything else? Yes, please. Oh. Uh, so you just mentioned a number of things that you can catalog and you can pull your control part out, out of that and you know, like all of the layers of your OSCO model on top of that. Well, I, yeah, that, and that's the, the kind of Rosetta Stone we were using was that the threat model, right? So we, we, if you can model the specific, you know, of a particular framework, map that to your threats, right? So TTPs, or you can use other frameworks, but 
specifically, right? Annotate those to specific threats. And on the mitigation side, right, you, you're annotating those with specific mitigate, mitigation techniques, defense techniques, right? Then all you have to do is maintain that mapping of these, these threats are mitigated by these uh, defense techniques. And of course, MITRE is doing that for you if you're using their framework, right? So that becomes the glue. So if you want to drop in, if I understood your question, if you drop in PCI, you want to drop in um, HIPAA, as long as you've annotated your uh, requirements and then the specific controls for those requirements with those threats, then in theory you can just assemble uh, the OSCAL and the policies from, from that mapping of threat to defense IDs. Um, it's, there's no formal, I mean, something that we can consider with the devs for OSCAL uh, to introduce, but there's no formal kind of threat to control mapping. Um, we just kind of added extra properties to the OSCAL. Yeah, so we could, but we should maybe submit a PR <laughs> to get that formalized. We're still just, we want to get more comfort, again, through the sledgehammer, real world testing. Uh, before we probably stand up and say this is the exact way to do it, let's codify it in OSCAL. I know you've had your hand up, Copas. What, what, what are you looking uh, for from the community? Just you know, start, start using it, get some you know, real world examples, and, and provide feedback, or is there specific things that you, know, you kind of want to, want to see? Or, or yeah, the, I mean, yeah, the, fir the, first, the first epic, if you will, is, is that we're going to go through threat modeling uh, exercises. This is something I've personally been involved with TAG and with security. Um, so we'll do, you know, project-specific threat modeling, those artifacts will be released. Then from that, we'll do the, the mapping. Those OSCAL generation tools and artifacts will be released. And then I think you know, everybody's you know, welcome to participate in those processes to create, review, and curate those. But I think it starts to get interesting for the, the operator community um, and maybe other projects who are, are looking to emulate the process. Once we've got that full OSCAL component model, the policy libraries, and we can demonstrate you know, how those are actually running. So I, think that, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, basically, we need a little bit of dev time from the team and you know, go through some, some reviews of what the OSCAL looks like for their project. OK, and I'm told to stop, so thank you.